Giant Size Storm number one brings the Giant Size comics to a close for now. As Storm, Monet, Cypher, Phantom X, and AIM scientist Ned head into the world to search for the cure to Storm's techno organic virus taking over her body. Today I'll answer What is Storm's fate in Giant Size X Men? What seeds does Hickman plant here for future X Men stories? And was the Giant Size experiment a success? Is this something that we can call one of the better stories? of the dawn of X. Hey, I'm Dave Busing, founder and editor-in-chief of ComicBookHerald.com. You are listening to Kraken Krakoa number 88. If you like the Comic Book Herald YouTube channel and Kraken Krakoa, please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing. Spoilers for Discuss Comics and lots of theories will follow. Writer Jonathan Hickman, art by Russell Dowderman, colors by Matthew Wilson, letters by Ariana Maher. We backtracked a little bit to see Doug Ramsey and Monet seeking out Phantom X for help with Storm's infection, something that we saw in the last Giant Size issue, Giant Size Phantom X. Doug here, he is flaunting his Warlock jetpack as they fly over to Phantom X's French abode. Last time we saw Doug with Warlock, he was making Ileana Rasputin promise to keep Warlock a secret. This was in the pages of Giant Size Nightcrawler. I'm definitely asking myself throughout this issue, what changed to make Doug sort of flaunt the existence and presence of Warlock uh, so specifically? I have not seen that in the Dawn of X, and it's not really discussed here. I find that pretty interesting. So the team gets together. They bring Phantom X and his aim buddy into the into the process, and they then enter the world. We get Russell Dodderman and Matt Wilson here, the creative team that did such amazing work with writer Jason Aaron across the mighty Thor. Uh, they get to go about as psychedelic as we've seen them go inside the chaotic science fiction world of the world. They're such an incredible art team together. I, they've been doing the covers from Marauders 2, which are, are absolutely astonishing. Everything from the big splashy stuff they do to the little the little facial expressions that change on Doug's face is is absolutely incredible artwork. I think the more we can get from this duo in the world of X in the future, the luckier we are going to be as fans. It's also exciting to see Cypher and Warlock together again in this issue, in what may well be the storyline Hickman seems most into throughout the entire Giant Size 5 issues. Honestly, next time, I hope Marvel just rolls with Giant Size Doug as series title because I think I'll be equally invested. Cypher not only flaunts Warlock, but boy howdy does that Warlock body armor look a, like a lot like a straight up Phalanx invasion. I suspect we'll start to see a lot more of this play out in Ten of Swords coming up, but Doug's connection to Warlock, a member of the Technarch, the alien society described in Powers of Ten as the unknowing plant of the Phalanx, makes him deeply critical to Hickman's Endgames, right? We know there's this connection here to the Phalanx that no one else has really across the X-Men lineup. If you recall back to in House and Powers, there's a blink and you'll miss it moment where Doug connects with the Krakoan plant and the plant visibly retains some of the Warlock style features on Doug's arm. This is when Professor X takes Doug to Krakoa for the first time to get him to like kind of speak the language and understand it. A leaf changes. You know, it starts to become this what looks like, you know, the presence of a techno organic virus, most most often associated with the likes of the Phalanx or the Technarch. So these seeds go way back in Hickman's House of X and Powers of Ten. They're still here. I think little design stuff like the the body armor kind of equating to the look of the Phalanx. That's that's there for a reason, right? Those connections are being made now, so we remember them later. Meanwhile, in the rest of the story, the crew continue battling through the world until reconnecting with Phantom X, here finding his long-lost clone twin, Ultimatown. If you remember back in my review of Giant Size, X-Men Phantom X, Phantom X and this other individual, I believe to be Ultimaton from Grant Morrison's new X-Men, they were separated as like identical clones, a, a almost statistical impossibility, and they have this connection throughout time where Phantom X goes back to the world and tries to convince him uh, to leave. Basically, just goes in and checks on him to make sure he's okay, which is nice. The question of Storm's resurrection, why would she even fight this virus when resurrection awaits, lingers throughout the comic. And Hickman's decision to tackle it head-on is a clear renunciation of fandom's collective cries of diminished stakes because mutants can always just resurrect, right? This comes up a lot. Like, well, she's going to be resurrected. What's the big deal? Instead of the inability to resurrect due to the nature of the vault's infection, Storm simply fights because that's who she is and because of her value in living. It's a simpler answer, honestly, than some of the deep, false scientific explanations and, frankly, like that I was looking into as far as, oh, it's a children of the vault infection and therefore it's different and, and blah, blah, blah. No, that's not what this is about, at least the way it's being presented to us. It's important in the era of Resurrection and Dawn of X that characters have reason 
to fight to keep living. I think we see this in X-Men number 7 as well with Apocalypse's Crucible. So Storm gets a number of opportunities to shine as the Omega level destroyer she should be, perhaps none more so than her internal rationale for saving her own life. I'm a mutant, I am a goddess, and I want to live. She, ultimately, that's all it is. Like Storm is just saying, I value my life. I enjoy this life that I'm living. It's important, and it doesn't need to be important to anyone else. It's important to me. I don't want to go through the resurrection protocols, you know, without necessity, without need. And I think that's a valuable thing to have as characters don't just give in because of the na nature of Krakoa. So to actually cure Storm, the crew is reliant on Ned's technology, a machine designed inside the world that can pull apart mechanical and organic material. Following the use of the machine though, which does work on Storm, the machine begins expanding until Ned can unleash a containment system that he happened to have brought. This is immediately and very clearly going to be a thing that comes up again as evidenced by Doug's unbelieving uh-huh when Ned tells him, you know, it's going to be fine. This is good because I'll admit, otherwise I was going to be underwhelmed by the apparent simplicity of this story. Again, without there actually being more to Storm's infection, it actually just being a we need to get to the world to find this deus ex machinina <laughs> that's going to to cure her, you know, that seemed a little uh, stereotypical, not stereotypical, a little standard. Fortunately, Hickman immediately returns to the development in a single-page epilogue with Cypher having a chat with this new entity that's being grown in the world. Now, maybe I'm being too literal here, and this could just be a byproduct of the fact that I just finished an upcoming Kraken Krakoa essay about Hickman's plans for Marvel Cosmic. Check that out this weekend. But a new sentience grown in the world makes me think of a world, a world mind. This is one of the types of galactic intelligences. Again, this is a literal mind grown in the world. Let's consider, too, the machine's original intent, separating machine and organic. Given this is a central theme of Hickman's X-Men, the rise of human hunting sentinels versus organic evolution of mutant kind, whose side do we anticipate this world mind might be on? Well, it, given this epilogue, and given Doug's allegiances to mutant kind, we we hope, right, he's one of the potential betrayals in the upcoming X of Swords, uh, maybe there's more of a mutant alliance than we would expect. I mean, it's in this Doug saying, I'll be seeing you too. I mean, <laughs> again, this is absolutely something that's going to come up later. His connections to this entity, his connections to Warlock and the Phalanx. Doug's got all this, this connective tissue now to huge cosmic elements that again i don't know that really anyone else in x-men has and that's very very interesting from cypher this character that again i think monet described as the team bambi earlier in this issue so for their part phantom x decides to stay with ultimaton within the world since the weapon plus lifer will not leave and ned's going to keep them company too which sure <laughs> why not while this puts some holes in my theory that the x-men themselves are potentially in a simulacrum of the world i generally like the idea of now both mutants in the world and the vault. We've got all these seeds across the Marvel Universe that Hickman has planted where we have mutant kind and allies uh, in these environments of advanced evolution, right? We have in the children of the vaults vault, we have uh, Laura Kinney and, and Darwin and Sink way back in, in X-Men issue number five, right? That happened, and we haven't heard hide nor hair from since. Uh, otherwise, we have now Phantom X, Ultimaton, and this AIM character <laughs> living in the world, right? We have all these places we can pull back from at potentially unexpected times, and that's compelling as well. So all told, the Hickman-written Giant Size series was it was fun for a reader like myself deeply invested in his X-Men universe although I found it all pretty uneven and I don't know that unless you're like a huge Morrison's new X-Men fan um, or again like full-on invested in the world of, of Dawn of X and Krakoa X-Men that Giant Size would really be a huge hit I still can't really even fit the Magneto piece of the puzzle with the other five issues too. So, like, as far as through lines go, definitely uh, uh, Jean Grey, Emma Frost, obviously Storm, those issues connect quite clearly. The Nightcrawler stuff, because of Doug and Warlock, does ultimately connect by the end of this comic. It's important to have read. And then Giant Size Phantom X clearly builds to the end. But Magneto teaming up with Namor, uh, the pieces of that puzzle, to me, I don't know where they fit, if they fit at all. So, there are some compelling seeds planted here that give us more for the future of X-Men. And we got two Russell Dodderman and Matt Wilson X issues, which I already can't get enough of right so that's that's a huge win honestly i'd be happy to see the series relaunched with more character specific focus i i do think the giant size series a little bit lacked like actually really digging in to these uh, specific individuals that are named 
in the issue uh, and kind of their motivations. Again, we do get some good stuff with Storm here, but it's, you know, it's a team book at the end of the day. Like, really, it's a, it is a giant size X-Men book, you know, as, as the name suggests. So a tighter through line as an annual series, I think could be something I'd be very invested in moving forward as well. But I'm curious, what did you think? And what theories do you have? You know, there's some big cosmic uh, X-Men implications here that I talked about. I'm curious to think what readers thought of this issue, of the fact that Storm's infection, you know, the resurrection, like ultimately was just about not wanting to go through resurrection, just wanting to fend that off. Was that a satisfying conclusion for this character who does get to unleash in a way that I think will make a lot of fans happy, who kind of, again, she's an Omega level mutant, right? Storm should be a huge deal and is a huge deal and a council member, right? So we, we definitely want to see her take the spotlight more in X-Men comics, I think, pretty universally. Um, this is a good start. So thanks for listening. You can find more of my stuff over at comicbookherald.com or patreon.com slash comicbookherald for ways to support uh, the site and Kraken Krakoa endeavors. Otherwise, I'm Dave. You can find my stuff, again, at comicbookherald.com, at comicbookherald online. You can look for the best comics ever in my Marvel this year podcast. And please, please, if you can, like and subscribe to the Comic Book Herald YouTube channel. Again, it helps me a lot with these Kraken Krakoa videos to keep things rolling thanks for listening uh, i am going to announce and probably i'll do this earlier in the next couple i'm going to review the x-men and excalibur preludes to x of swords that came out today as well so you can look for those videos but i do also have a big thing coming up uh this weekend we're going to do a ten of swords to x of swords uh prediction party and i'm going to have uh the the cerebros podcast so they're going to be on to talk uh to x of swords and i'm also going to have on blurred without fear a uh, popular youtuber here who is is one of my favorites on you know talking comics on youtube so look forward to that as well i'll have some details coming soon but that's going to be like saturday i think circa 11 a.m central so that's a coming check it out if you are so inclined but otherwise thanks for listening everybody and as always enjoy the comics <laughs>